I mean of an introduction, uh, clay brick is the oldest manufacturing building material, although much of its history is lost in antiquity. Uh, the oldest burned or fired brick uh, have been found on the sites of the ancient cities of Babylonia, uh, and some are estimated to be as much as 6,000 years old. Uh, reference to clay brick is made in the Bible in the book of Exodus, where the Israelites under captivity in Egypt I uh, were making bricks and had to mix it with straw. So I, I think this is what's happening here. Uh, I don't think there's any Tyrone brick people in, the, in, the, in, in this particular slide. Uh, they, these particular brick uh, would, would have been made, uh, handmade, and left out to dry in the sun, so they wouldn't have been burned or anything like that. Uh, the pottery industry was probably the first of the clay making industries uh, to be mentioned in the Coal Island region uh, and indeed there's mention in the Belfast newsletter of September 1759 of pottery industry in Coal Island. Uh, by 1837 uh, you had fire brick, fire clay, crucibles and earthenware uh, were being sent out of Coal Island. And the Ulster Fire Clay Works, I think, was formed in around 1890. Uh, so from then on, clay, clay manufacturing was happening in Coal Island. There probably was handmade bricks being made early in those early days. Uh, but it was not until probably the early 1900s that actually machine-made brick were, were made. Uh, the Coal Island Brick Company was formed in 1939. I, this here is uh, just a diagram of the industry that was going on in Coal Island uh, and uh, where the various things were. Uh, you can see where, uh, it's not very good this one here, uh, it doesn't work. Uh, we have the corn mill, we have the brickyard, we have the Ulster Fire Clay Works, uh, and you can see where the clay pits were there as well. Uh, the first kiln, I think, in Coal Island uh, was built in about 1939. In fact, the late Bob Brannigan from Coal Island claimed that he was the first man to set a brick in the kiln in 1939. Uh, and what he used to tell me frequently, you don't need to tell me nothing about the brick. I was the first man that set a brick in the kiln in 1939. <laughs> uh, this here uh, is a photograph in the early 50s uh, of uh, the Carlin Road Yard. Uh, there's very, in fact, I think it's probably more like late 50s, judging by the type of lorries that they have. Uh, the late Jimmy Archer is in. There's one of the men in that there, but I'm not quite sure which, which one he is. Is that the middle one there? Hmm. You think? That's him. Uh, that, would that be Jimmy there? That's Jimmy in the centre. Yes, yes. And the boy to the right is Sidney Yor from Ballon Kelly. Ah, right. <laughs> Thank you, Alec. That other chap's old E. I think he was a, a sort of a poor man in the church. Yes. <coughs> but you can see, they, no, they did, they, did, they did have their own lorries in those days. Uh, when I first started work, uh, uh, way back in 1968, uh, the, the companies had all amalgamated uh, and the bricks and pipe industry were all incorporated under one banner and it was known as Coal Island Brick and Pipe. Uh, the company had also acquired Glastry Brick Company at the top of the Ballyga Martin Road. Uh, and basically I started my managerial career down there. Uh, in the late 70s and 80s then, uh, the Ulster Fire Clays uh, was, was sold off. Uh, and Coal Island Brick and Pipe was then renamed Tyrone Brick Limited. Uh, we had three plants. We had plant number three, uh, which was the Coal Island Brick. Uh, we had plant number four, which was the Tyrone Works. And plant number five, which was the Carlin Road. 
So if we move on now uh, onto the technology of brick making, uh, brick making can be broken down into various stages. We've got the actual quarrying or winning of the clay, we have clay preparation, we have the forming, drying and firing, and then the selection. So we might well ask the question, what is clay? And that's something you dig out of the ground, yes, but it's a wee bit more special than that. Uh, and I've got a wee sample of it here. Uh, in brick making terms, clay covers a range of naturally occurring raw material. And clays can vary considerably in their physical properties, their colour, their hardness. But they do, they do have uh, certain similarities, and that is that they all have the ability to be ground up, mixed with water, uh, formed into a plas plastic mix of some kind, and for formed into bricks. Uh, this clay then can be fired to a high temperature of usually in excess of 1000 degrees, and that's where it attains its hard weather resistant characteristics. Uh, looking at this here, we basically have a slide of how the clay pit would have looked. Uh, you can see the various sections there. Uh, and then that's how the clay would have been excavated. You had your D8s and you also had your scrapers. And the clay was then layered in a huge stockpile. Normally there was about a year's supply of clay brought, brought in at the one time. Uh, on the clay preparation, uh, here we have uh, a pan mill, which many in the audience here, oh, uh, oh, where have we got to now? Where? Oh, ah, I think I think we have uh, maybe one more. Ah, that's it. Uh, we've got our pan mill where the clay was ground up, and then we also have high speed rollers where the clay was ground down much finer. Uh, at this stage here, we have the extrusion. Uh, the clay is propelled by means of a screw. Uh, towards the front where it is pushed out through a die which is the shape of the brick. So you can, yeah, I'm doing things wrong here. Uh, so you can see where, where the column of clay is extruded from. Uh, this here was the, the modern setting machine that we had in Dungannon. Uh, the bricks were lifted by, by means of uh, the setting head here and set onto the top of the wagons. Uh, I don't know if there's any prizes for guessing who's standing up on the top there. Uh, I'm certainly looking at one of, one of them here. He's looking very studious at me. Uh, uh, that's Jim there. <laughs> So then, after, after the forming has taken place, uh, the, the brick have got to be dried, and then, and then they've, they've, got, they've got to be fired. In, in the early days, uh, in, in Coal Island, uh, the bricks were fired in what was known as a Hoffman kiln. Uh, now, Hoffman kiln, it's basically a series of little rooms or chambers uh, and the kiln was actually named after a German, uh, Kiedrich Hoffmann, and he patented this design in 1858. Now, with, with the Hoffmann kiln, uh, well, uh, that's a cross-section of one there, uh, the bricks were manually set into it. Uh, the guys who set the brick into it uh, were known as the Green Squad. Uh, because at that stage the bricks were dry and dry bricks were known as green bricks. So we had the green squad who set, set the bricks in. Uh, in, in, the, in the Hoffman kiln, uh, the fire travelled right around in, in a circle through, this, through the series of chambers. Uh, when a chamber was filled with dry brick, uh, the door of it, or was known in those days as the wicket, it was built up 
and plastered. Now in uh, Plant 3 in Coal Island, we had a guy, and that was his job all the time, to build up these wickets. So when he plastered them, he then uh, would have written the Daily News in the wet plaster. Uh, and usually the Daily News uh, could have been quite libelous and certainly scandalous. Uh, and uh, it was a, a affectionately called it the Daily Wicket. Um, if, if he had anything to report on anyone, it was duly written in the, in the Daily Wicket. Uh, then, uh, when, when the bricks uh, had been finished firing, uh, the door of the wicket, it was knocked down. And this is where the Red Squad came in. So the Red Squad were, were the guys uh, who selected the brick in the chamber and, and packaged them into bales, usually of 500, and then they were wheeled outside. Now the Red Squad's job, uh, it was pretty hot in there sometimes. Uh, because you were operating close, close, close to the fires, uh, so uh, in days gone past, there was talk that the chambers were so hot people had to go in with wet bags over their head. Now I think that did happen. I certainly never saw it happen, and I, I never did it myself. Uh, but it, it suffice to say, you know, that it it, w it was quite hard work. Uh, so then, uh, when I. Uh, I moved up to plant five, but you no, know, before the plant was re was renovated, uh, there there was a tunnel kiln there. Now a tunnel kiln, uh, that's another that's another uh, section of the Hoffman kiln. In fact, you can see the heat behind there. Uh, uh, well, we'll not go back on that one at the minute. Uh, with 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 the tunnel kiln, the bricks were set on wagons. And the, the wagons moved slowly uh, through, through the heat. Uh, with the Hoffman kiln, the heat moved. But in the tunnel kiln, it was the actual bricks that moved. And they moved slowly through the tunnel kiln where they encountered uh, a degree of rise in temperature. Uh, and then by the time they got to the end of the tunnel, they, they, were, they, they were ready, ready then uh, for, for, for sorting. Uh, I was just going to actually take take you back uh, to the Hoffman kiln. In my early days, I can remember uh, we were doing some experiments. The kiln was being fired with oil, but then we were doing some experiments using gas. Uh, and my job was to monitor temperatures and record them. But I had this wonderful instrument, and I thought it was very very clever. Uh, and it was called a disappearing filament pyrometer. <laughs> and basically what you did, you pointed it through the hole uh, at the temperature, and then you adjusted it until you actually couldn't see the little filament inside it. So I thought it was terribly clever, but uh, there was a kiln foreman, uh, and he obviously didn't think very much of me, and he didn't think very much of my instrumentation. <laughs> uh, and uh, he was not very complimentary as to what I could do with my pyrometer. <laughs> but that, that, that's, only, that's only by the way. Uh, but in Plant 5, uh, the, the early tunnel kiln, uh, it did give a little bit of problems. And there was, there was various mechanical problems. Its temperature control was not very good. And uh, it was reputedly told me that it was designed uh, in Lowry's Hotel in the Moy. So maybe that's, that's why it, it wasn't particularly efficient or it wasn't particularly accurate. Uh, the, the later kilns that came into Plant 5 and Plant 4 uh, were designed by a German company called Carl Walter. Uh, and in Plant 5, uh, there was a complete new kiln and dryer put in in 1975, and a similar one put into Plant 4 in, in 1977. And uh, they certainly were, at the time, state, state of the art. And in fact, the two plants, you know, in the late 70s were probably, they were probably among the most modern in Europe at that, at that stage. Uh, 
th this here was just a little slide of the controls. Uh, yeah, the control panel. Uh, we had uh, a German man who commissioned the whole thing called Reinhard Brinkmann. He was a very, very astute, clever man. Uh, during the building of the plant, uh, we, we also had another German engineer called Alphonsus Grobecker. And Alf Alphonsus liked, liked a wee drink in the evenings. And uh, he, occasionally on a Friday evening, he would say, you, me, Jims, the, the electric mans, and who else had, he had another, Richie Niels, who was the foreman, stagger in at five o'clock. <laughs> and uh, I must admit we quite enjoyed it. <laughs> so, uh, with the tunnel kiln, uh, the heat was supplied by oil burners from the top, and you can see all that pipe work there uh, it, uh, was, the, was the oil burners. Later, later on, we used gas as well. Uh, that there is uh, basically uh, what the bricks looked like when they came out of the kiln. And you can see they're, they're all standing nice and straight. Jim McAllister would have been proud of those. Uh, and he would have been giving himself a wee pat on the back. So they, they all did look pretty good. Then uh, for small batches of brick, uh, we had what was known as a moving hoot kiln. Uh, with the moving hoot kiln, uh, the bricks were set on the base and then the hoot travelled on rails over the top of the bricks. The batch was fired and then the hood was lifted and, ta and taken back again. So it, it was particularly useful for small batches of brick, uh, for uh, special shapes and brick that, you know, that were irregular in size and needed uh, no special treatment. So it, it was a very handy, handy bit, bit of kit indeed. Uh, that's just another wee slide of the con of the controls and so on 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 top of the kiln. Uh, after the brick came out, they were they were then packaged and selected. Uh, that's just a photograph there of some packaging. Uh, for the purists here, uh, those aren't your own brick. Uh, unfortunately, I did, I did one. Uh, I see Eddie looking at it. He would, he would have known the difference. <laughs> but that's basically how they were packaged. And uh, in Jerome Brick, they were strapped onto pallets. Now, throughout uh, the, the, uh, the years in the Brick Company, there were obviously a lot of characters around. Uh, and and some, some of them certainly will go down in the annals of history. Uh, we had a clay pit manager uh, who would have been of Scottish descent, uh, and he always had a few good stories to tell. And one of the ones that he told, he had, he had two people working with him, and one was off sick and he said he couldn't go on because 50% of his workforce were off. <laughs> uh, so he had, he, had, he had one or two good ones. Uh, he also had an assistant uh, who was told one day they were trying to get the water pump going uh, and it needed prime so he took off his wellington and he filled it with water and then he primed the pump with it and proceeded to put his wellington back on again. <laughs> so uh, I think those things actually did happen now. Uh, and then uh, in, in plant three, uh, and this has probably not been sort of politically correct here, we had Tommy Donnelly, who was affectionately known as the Dummy Donnelly. Now, Tommy was a very intelligent man, uh, and he could relay everything that was happening, and he could tell people by sign language what, what was going on. But the men used to tease him that he was about to become pension age. Uh, and even when he was coming 64, 65, uh, he always wrote on the ground that he was 48. Uh, what used to happen, the, the man used to do this, which was the, the, the stamp for his pension book, and point towards the post office. Uh, but he, he would then uh, have written on the ground that, that he was 48. Uh, another, another one that, that we had uh, 
was was known uh, to keep a drop of whiskey in his tea flask, and uh, he was a machine operator. He drove the bulldozer, but uh, he, he always insisted that it was tea he had in it. But it was a wee bit a wee bit stronger now than than, than tea. Uh, and of course, then uh, we we had uh, a famous production director. I don't think he's here. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, I can remember once upon a time I said to him, uh, look, I need this Friday off because I'm going to a wedding. And he said, will you be away the whole day? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he didn't particularly like you take, taking time off. Uh, then uh, we'll move on to the maintenance staff. Because there, was, there was one or two of those. Uh, we had one who had served in the Second World War. And uh, the boys used to ask him questions about how you'd have crept in on the enemy. And they would have had him cr crawling on his belly across the workshop floor to demonstrate <laughs> how he crawled in on the Germans. And he, he also professed to, to have thought to have shot th 30 Japanese out, out of a tree with one shot out of his bazooka. <laughs> uh, so it was... Uh, it was quite. It was. It was quite. Quite. Quite good telling at the time. Uh, then uh, we we had another fitter, and uh, most of the stories told about him either involved going to the toilet or coming back from it. <laughs> but <laughs> there was one such story told. He he talked a wee bit through his nose, and apparently he was in the toilet and. He started to sing there, one fair county in Ireland. So somebody shouted at him, are you all right in there, Jordy? And he says, he says how the hell did you know it was me? <laughs> <laughs> so that, 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 that was just a, a, wee, a wee example of the kind of characters that, uh, that, 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 that we worked with. Uh, but of, of course then, uh, the whole thing would not have been complete without, without the kiln burners. Now, uh, the kiln burners were, they were a breed unto themselves. Uh, and sadly, some have passed on and hopefully are now, now in that great, great brickyard in the sky. But uh, we uh, still, have, still have a few left. But one of, one of them, I can remember coming in at uh, quarter to seven in the morning and at a quarter to seven in the morning I would never have been in very good temper and uh, he said I've got someone to show you so I thought hmm, there's been a breakdown here in the middle of the night or something but when I went on top of the kiln there were two chalk marks drawn and he said do you know the, di the distance between those two marks so I was beginning to get a bit crabby at that stage and I says no I do not and he says uh, 29 foot, two and a half inches. That's how far Bob Beeman jumped in the Mexico Olympics in 1968. <laughs> so you could have seen where, 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 his, where his mind was <laughs> during, during the night. Uh, then we had, we had one that was very good at drawing cartoons, and I think he drew cartoons of us all. Uh, and in fact, I even had one, and it, I'm not sure if he is here tonight, he did manage to hit me on the head with a brick, and I still have the scar across there to, to, to prove it. Uh, but if, if he's here, he'll, he'll, know, he'll know who I was. Uh, one of the other ones, I, apparently, and I, I'd omit it to mention it, on the Coal Island Road, I think probably in the sort of 50s, maybe early 60s, there was also a small brickworks known as Brown's Brickworks. Uh, and in Brown's Brickworks, you didn't earn as much money as you might have earned if you were in Tyrone Brick. So it was everybody's aspiration to get out of Brown's Brickworks to go to Tyrone. But one of, one of the guys, apparently, he was wheeling a barrow of brick across the yard at Brown's, and word came, I don't know how it got to him, but word come that he had got a job in Tyrone Brick. So apparently he just left the bar up in the middle of the yard with all the bricks on it, got on his bicycle and, ro and rode to Tyrone. Uh, so that, 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 was, that was how much he thought of wanting to earn some, some extra money. Uh, so that, that's just an example uh, of, of, the, of the characters that we had. Uh, 
As I say, we had machine men, we had green squads, we had red squads. Uh, and we all, it all had its own terminology, and to the outsider, it, no, it was a different language. Uh, this here is just a flow diagram of how, it's not any particular brick plant, but it's how a brick plant uh, would have operated. Where we started off with the stockpile, the grinding pan, the rollers, uh, the screening, the extruder, the cutter. Uh, dryer, setting machine, kiln, and then the selection, and then finally away, away to the away to the yard. Uh, in in the early days of, of brick making, it was a wee bit like Henry Ford's cars. You could have any colour you liked as long as it was red. Uh, so no brick were known red brick. You couldn't get anything else. But then over the years, I. Uh, C colours evolved, uh, there was additions to the brick, no, that made them dark brown, uh, there, was, there was sand blasted onto the surface of the brick, uh, there was other types of clay, they, to own brick shale, the natural firing colour of it was red. Uh, there was a couple of different ways of firing it, and I hope there's no chemistry boffins here, because I get my ferrosis and ferrex always mixed up. But uh, if there was plenty of oxygen while you were burning, the bricks came out red. Uh, if there was a deficiency of oxygen, uh, they then acquired a bluey colour, and that was all down to the chemical reaction with, with, with the iron in, in the clay. Uh, in fact, it was once said in the early days in plant five, there was a kiln burner who apparently, uh, in, in the, in the evening when he thought there was nobody around, he turned the oil up as far as he could go and then he went for half an hour or an hour up to the pub in Dungannon, I think possibly to Mamel Holland's, but apparently he could look out through the window and he could see what the smoke was like coming, coming out, uh, so he knew how the kiln was going. But uh, if, if, he'd, if he'd known uh, to sort of turn the oxygen down a wee bit, he was years ahead of his time because he, he would have been forming brick uh, that, that weren't sort of in vogue until maybe 20, 20 odd years later. Uh, there was various other textures as well. Uh, in the early days in, in uh, Coal Island brick, uh, it was what's known as soft extrusion. The, the mixture was very wet. It couldn't, it couldn't be handled by hand until after it was dried. Uh, but the texture was made with a wire, and it was just like a little fine ripple. I think we have an example over there. Uh, then uh, when we moved up to uh, Dungannon, uh, it was what was known as stiff extrusion. The, the bricks were formed stiff enough to be handled, and the texture was put on using a roller. Uh, and it, it gave a similar texture, but maybe just a slightly rougher, rougher type of texture. And then we had other ones with drag face, and then we had, you no, know, the old red smooth face facing brick. Uh, Tyrone brick in 1995 uh, were taken over by Redlands. Um, sadly then, my services were no longer required. I, I think they really did miss me, but they didn't admit it. Uh, then in 2001, uh, Redlands were taken over by the CRH group, uh, and the CRH group never knew what they were missing, for they didn't know I existed. Uh, this here uh, is, uh, no prizes for guessing where that is, that's an example of one of the jobs that was, uh, again, that was done with Plant 5 Red Smooth. Uh, quite early on uh, in, in the plant's history, after, after it was renovated. Uh, and that, of course, is the chapel in Coal Island. And it is a very fine building and looks well to this day. Uh, and this one uh, with the council offices. And that actually was probably one of the very first jobs uh, that was done uh, after, the, after the plant 
uh, was, was renovated. Uh, that there is uh, just a photograph of how the plant looks at the minute up in plant five. And as you can see, it does look a, a bit derelict. And uh, unfortunately, that is the end of the metaphorical road. And brick making in Dungannon, Coal Island, uh, ceased in early in 2009, uh, which we'll all agree it was, it was a sad day for the, the area. It was a sad day for all the workers over the years who had put in sterling work. Uh, and with that uh, was lost an awful lot of uh, technology, an awful lot of skill. And people over the years uh, had some very, very happy memories in Durham Brick. I don't know, I, I certainly had. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, that's just a very quick run through. Uh, we didn't get too heavily involved in history. We didn't get too heavily involved in technology. But in a nutshell, uh, that uh, is brick making in the Coal Island, Dungannon area. Thank you very much. Thank you. I was one of the ones that persuaded you to do this, Jim Allen. I'd asked him uh, some time ago, could he get a volunteer? And he said there was no better man than yourself. And sir, you had a superb address this evening. I, mean, we, I think we've all enjoyed it. It's been informative. And it's great to see how many of the old brick men have obviously turned up to support you. Uh, if you could throw as big a crowd at the funeral, you'd be doing damn well. <laughs> So on behalf of us all, I'd like to thank you again and ask you to show your appreciation. Thank you.